Hi, everyone. We left off in the last lecture talking about the measurements that we can observe from stars and how we use those measurements to determine the properties of those stars. So let's pick up where we left off there and keep running with it. When, when the process of measuring luminosity and temperature really got off the ground in the early 20th century, um, scientists, well, the first two major ones were two scientists by the name of Hertzsprung and Russell, um, compared their notes and started graphing the luminosity of stars versus their temperatures to create what came to be known as the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, or the HR diagram for short. And the HR diagrams are always laid out the same way. You're plotting, it's a scatter plot. An HR diagram is a scatter plot with luminosity on the vertical axis, so faint, oops, pardon me, faint stars on the bottom and bright stars on the top. And then temperature is always on the horizontal axis, but it's a little backwards, um, somewhat for historical reasons. Um, with hot stars and therefore the blue stars on the left side and going down to the coolest reddest stars on the right side. Um, when the temperatures of large numbers of stars first started getting measured and cataloged, uh, the women who were doing this work, and it was mostly women at the time, um, devised a system of classifying the spectrum of stars to relate uh, and organize their catalog of peak wavelengths and temperatures and colors. Um, and these spectral types, um, through a little bit of trial and error, like you always do when you're doing something for the first time, um, they created this ranking system with the O stars being the hottest bluest stars in the sky and then going from hottest to coolest it's the b type stars are still bluish white a and then the f types are a little cooler but still hot they're white hot g type stars are stars that are around 6000 kelvin these are stars like the sun so they're yellowish a little cooler than that you have k type stars which are orange in color, and then the coolest reddest stars are the M-type stars. So on this diagram here, you see these letters across the bottom. These letters are a code, essentially, a way of encoding information about temperature and color and peak wavelength. So there's a lot of information encoded in that one letter. So remembering the sequence, O, B, A, F, G, K, M, is a useful shorthand for saying if you if you're studying G type stars, well that one letter means it's stars of around this temperature, around this color, around this peak wavelength. It doesn't tell you luminosity. You can have stars that are of similar temperature, but they could be faint or medium brightness or very bright or very, very bright. So these spectral types tell you temperature and color, but not luminosity. This is an important distinction to remember. But, we remember from last time, luminosity depends on, the luminosity of a star depends on the star's radius and its temperature. Remember the 4, the pi, and the sigma, those are all constants. So if you have a graph of luminosity versus temperature, well then you can look on this graph without having to actually do the math that we talked about last time. You can look at this graph and get a sense of the size of the star, right? Stars are bright, they have high luminosities, either because they're large or because they're hot or both. Stars can be low luminosity, either because they're small or because they're cool or both. So you can just eyeball this graph and say, well, these stars in this corner, these stars are faint, even though they're really hot. How can that be? How can stars that are this hot be this faint? And the answer is because they're very small. 
So the smallest stars are in this corner of the HR diagram. And then as you look from the lower left to the upper right, these stars are getting bigger and bigger and bigger because they are getting brighter even though they're getting cooler. These stars up here in the upper right corner, these are there's a reason why they're called supergiants, and that's because these stars are so big that they are very bright. They're very high luminosity, even though they're quite faint. That's how big these stars are. These stars are so large that they can they have such a large surface area that they can let lots of light out every second, even though the surface of that star is not very hot. So as you go from the lower left to the upper right in the HR diagram, you go from stars that are so small. These stars down here, these white dwarfs, these white dwarfs are called white dwarfs because um, they are white hot, or in, this, in some cases bluish hot, and yet they're so small that they're quite faint. These stars are around the size of the Earth, which is very small by star standards. So the size of these stars, you could measure the size of these white dwarfs in solar radii, although sometimes measuring them in Earth radii is more practical. When you get up to the size of the red supergiants, you could measure the size of these stars in solar radii, and they are hundreds of solar radii in, in size. Stars like Betelgeuse are red supergiants, and Betelgeuse is several hundred solar radii in size. They're several hundred times, Betelgeuse is several hundred times the size of the sun. It's actually several astronomical units in radius. These red supergiants can be several astronomical units in radius. That's how big they get. So. When you look at this HR diagram, luminosity can span large ranges from the very brightest that are a million solar radii down to the very faintest that are tens of thousandths of solar radii. Stars can go from being about 3,000 Kelvin to about 30,000 Kelvin, and they can go from being the size of small planets like Earth to the size of small solar systems. Ah. Um, before I get to that, one of the first things that people realized when they created HR diagrams for the first time is that stars fall in these four groups. Stars don't happen in just any random combination of luminosity and temperature in nature. Something about the way stars work means that most of the stars in the sky lie along this diagonal line here. This diagonal group here is what's called the main sequence, because it's the main way that stars happen. About 90% of the stars in the sky are on the main sequence. The other 10% are on the red giant branch, the supergiant branch, or in the white dwarf group. So in this class, because we're mostly focusing on planets, we're going to focus mostly on main sequence stars. Most of the planets well, sorry, most of the stars that we've found that have extrasolar planets orbiting them have been main sequence stars. Now, maybe that's only because, I mean, maybe that's because most stars are main sequence stars. So since most stars are main sequence stars, of course, most of the planets found around them are going to be main sequence stars. Um, but also, stars spend most of their lifetimes as main sequence stars. So if we want to find stars in the prime of their life so that they've got nice stable planets, possibly with nice stable ecosystems, possibly that have life on them, let's look at main sequence stars. That's why most of the stars we're going to be talking about for the rest of the semester will be main sequence stars. So if we focus on that, if we look at main sequence stars, one other thing that we can do is study main sequence stars in binary systems. Uh, binary stars are where there are two stars orbiting around each other. Why are those two stars orbiting each other? Because they're trapped by each other's gravitational pull. The two stars are orbiting around each other, tugging each other with their gravity, and they're bound around each other in the same way that the sun's gravity binds the earth in orbit around it. And by studying the gravity of those stars, we can figure out the mass. 
So now we have a slightly different trick. It's actually a very different trick. We have a very different method for measuring the mass of these stars. Because you can really only study the mass of the stars directly when they are exerting gravity on other stars around them. Not the only way to do it. I misspoke a minute ago. But it's certainly the more direct way to do it for our purposes here. And when you study a bunch of main sequence stars in binary systems and you measure their masses, when you graph the luminosity of the star versus the mass of the star, those main sequence stars all lie along this nice tight diagonal line. There's a reason for that. Main sequence stars are very stable, very well behaved stars. There's a reason why this line is very straight and why this diagonal trend here is very straight. And that is, I mean, it's not straight straight, but it is a, it is a well constrained trend. Main sequence stars are nice and stable. They maintain a steady luminosity, a steady temperature, they shine with a constant brightness, they don't heat up too much or don't cool down too much, much like the sun. And so since mean sequence stars all lie along this nice tight line, the equation for that line is that the luminosity is proportional to the mass to the 3.5 power. That's the equation for the trend line here. For all main sequence stars, the luminosity is proportional to the mass to the 3.5 power. Well, now we've got another trick up our sleeve, because we can rearrange the math here to say, well, we can solve for the mass. The mass of these main sequence stars is the luminosity to the 1 over 3.5 power. And this equation is nice and simple, because why? Because we're picking our units conveniently. We're talking about stars in terms of suns in solar units. So if the mass is proportional to the luminosity of the 3.5, then the mass in solar masses, the mass of the main sequence star, is just the luminosity in solar luminosities to the 1 over 3.5 power. Now, take this with a small grain of salt. This relationship only works for main sequence stars. Conveniently enough, most stars are main sequence stars, in which case this equation holds. So we can now add another line to our spreadsheet and say, well, if I have the luminosity, then I know the mass of the main sequence. So maybe I'll make a note for myself. A mass of a main sequence star, just so I don't forget that, I, that this equation only works for main sequence stars. The mass of that star is luminosity in solar, lum in solar luminosities to the 1 over 3.5 power. So, the mass is luminosity in solar luminosities, just like we have it, to the power of 1 divided by 3.5. You definitely want to put parentheses around this so that it takes 1 divided by 3.5, and then it takes all of that as the power of luminosity, of the, of the exponent on luminosity. All right, and now this gives me the mass in, I'm going to call it m sun, uh, times the mass of the sun. So the star we were looking at last time, this star is a little brighter than the sun. It's the same temperature as the sun. Uh, it's a little bigger than the sun. Well, gosh, why is it a little brighter than the sun? And why is it a little bigger than the sun? Because it's a little more massive than the sun. It has a little more mass than the sun does. In fact, what I just said is not a trivial statement. With main sequence stars, why are these stars up here the brightest? The answer is because they're the most massive. It turns out the reason why main sequence stars are so well behaved, the reason why both of these trends are so well constrained, the reason why there's very little scatter in the main sequence here or in this graph here is because all of the properties of a main sequence star are determined by one thing the mass. The mass of a star is the one major thing that you want to know. These stars up here at the top of the main sequence, these are the high mass ones. And because they are high mass, because these stars are born with a high mass, they are the brightest, they're the hottest, they're the bluest, and they're the largest.
and as you go down the main sequence, these stars are getting dimmer, cooler, redder, and smaller. Why? Because they're less massive. So the lowest mass main sequence stars are the ones at the bottom tip here. The mass of a star is its destiny. When you look across the main sequence, these stars are very different. These are very big, these are very small, hot, cold, bright, dim, blue, red. These stars are all very, very, very different. The one thing that main sequence stars all have in common is their power source. The thing that defines a main sequence star is that all of them shine because they're hot, and they're hot because they are fusing hydrogen atoms together and turning them into helium atoms inside the core of the star because when you take hydrogen and slam hydrogen atoms together and transform them into helium that releases energy and that energy heats up the inside of the star and that heat radiates outward until it reaches the surface of the star so that the the nuclear power, the, the hydrogen fusion happening in the core of the star heats up the surface and that hot dense surface emits its black body spectrum and the star shines with a luminosity. That star shines with a luminosity determined by its temperature and its radius. But ultimately, all of that, the temperature, the luminosity, and the radius, they're all determined by the mass. The higher the mass of the main sequence star, it's going to be brighter, hotter, larger, and bluer. But, but the one thing these stars have in common, from the big hot blue ones to the dim faint red small ones, is they're all powered by hydrogen fusion reactions. More on that another time. But really, if you wanted to know one thing, if you were only allowed to know one thing about a star, the thing you would want to know is the mass. Because knowing that, that, knowing that the, the star has a certain mass tells you everything about it. The mass of a star is its destiny. If you were told, oh, I, you have a main sequence star, you're looking at a main sequence star, and that main sequence star has a mass of three times the mass of the sun. Well every three solar mass star where's my mouse there it is every three solar mass star has this luminosity this temperature this radius now you know everything including how long it's going to live because another the other thing that's determined by the mass of a star is how long it can live a star will shine a star will stay alive and shine as long as there's hydrogen fuel in the core to burn well, how long does that take? How long does a star live? Well, it depends on how much fuel it has, right? The more fuel the star has, the longer it can burn that fuel. But a star is burning its fuel at a certain rate. The faster the star burns the fuel, the faster it dies. How much fuel a star has is proportional to the mass. The more mass the star has, the more of that mass it can burn. But the burn rate the rate at which that star consumes its fuel is determined by the luminosity, right? Why are these stars so bright? How can they be a hundred thousand, a million times the brightness of the sun? And the answer is because they're burning their fuel that fast. The higher the luminosity, the faster you have to burn that hydrogen fuel in the core to generate the light that ends up escaping as the star's luminosity. So the lifetime of a star is simply determined by the ratio of mass to luminosity. Oh, but hey, these are main sequence stars. The luminosity depends on the mass to the 3.5 power. So we've got mass on top divided by mass to the 3.5 on the bottom. That all simplifies to be the luminosity of a star. Sorry, not the luminosity. The lifetime of a star is simply proportional to the mass to the negative 2.5 power focus not so much on the value it's negative the mass of the star is there it's the lifetime is mass to a negative power which means the more massive the star is the shorter its lifetime is 
it seems counterintuitive, right? If a star has more mass, it's got more fuel. Surely that means that it's going to live longer. No, because the downside of having more mass is the star is going to have a much higher luminosity. So, for instance here, if you've got a 10 solar mass star, a ten, every 10 solar mass main sequence star has a luminosity of 10,000 solar luminosities. So if you're looking at a 10 solar mass star, what's its lifetime? Well, its mass is 10 solar masses, but its luminosity is 10,000 times. That star might have 10 times as much fuel as the sun does, but it's burning that fuel 10,000 times faster. So it actually burns out quicker. Higher mass stars burn out faster. A, this 10 solar mass star is only going to live 1 1,000th the lifetime of the sun. And now the nice thing, so what is that? You know, what, what is 1 1,000th the lifetime of the sun? Well, we know from studying the sun that you know, it's a lot easier to study the sun. It's right next door. The sun is going to live a total lifetime of about 10 to the 10 years. What is 10 to the 10? That's 10 billion. So the lifetime of a star in years will be that mass to the negative 2.5. That gi This gives you the mass in solar masses. Or this, this is the mass, the m is the mass in solar masses to the negative 2.5. So this is what fraction of the sun's lifetime the star will live times the lifetime of the sun, 10 to the 10 years. Now this will give you the lifetime of that star in years. And that's how we know that if when, by, by, by plugging in the mass, all you need to know is the mass. Because like I said, the mass of a star is its destiny. When a star is born, that star is born with a certain amount of mass, a certain amount of gas, and a certain amount of fuel. And if a star is born with a high mass, the, 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 the 10s, the 30s, the 60 solar masses, these stars are destined to live fast and die young. They are very high mass and they burn out. They're very, they burn hot, they burn bright, but they don't live that long. They burn through their fuel so fast, these stars only live for a few million years. By the time you get down to a middling mass star like our sun, our sun only has one solar mass, it's gonna live for 10 billion years. The lowest mass stars though, they, are not very impressive. They're small, they're dim, they're red, they're cool. But they're burning their fuel so slowly that these stars could live for maybe trillions of years. They're very long lived because they burn through that fuel so very, very slowly. The downside of which is they're not very bright. So let's add that to our equation list. Here's the main sequence lifetime. The main sequence lifetime is mass to the power of negative 2.5 times, and I'm going to put this in, I'm going to put this in parentheses just to be safe. Right, mass to the negative 2.5 power times uh, 10, nope, uh, 10 to the 10th power. Did I do it right? Mass to the negative 2.5 times 10 to the 10. Yep. Okay. And that is the lifetime in years. That's an awful big number because most stars live for a very long time. Let's turn this into scientific notation and make our lives a little easier. So if I right click here and I say format cells, I want to put this number in scientific notation. So let's go scientific. Uh, sure, two decimal places, that sounds good. Okay, so this star will live, this star with uh, 1.1 solar masses will live for 7.8 times 10 to the 9 years. That star will live for 7.8 billion years. 10 to the 9 is a billion, right? So remember, the higher the mass, the shorter its lifetime. This star is a little more massive than the sun. 
So it's going to live a little shorter lifetime than the sun. This star is only going to live for 7.8 billion years, whereas the sun, you know, if it's a one solar mass star, it would live for 10 to the 10, 1 times 10 to the 10 years. Then undo so I don't get rid of my equation here. Now I know five big physical intrinsic properties of this star just based on the three little things that I can measure. I know how hot, how bright it is, how hot it is, how big it is, how much mass it's made of, and I know how long it's going to live. Now you know truly the destiny of a star. And then I save my work so I don't get rid of that. What happens after that? Right? When a star is born, a newborn star uh, is born. When a, when a star is born, it comes to life because it starts fusing hydrogen in the core. And it becomes a main sequence star. However much mass it's born with determines where it's going to lie on the main sequence. And as long as there's hydrogen fuel to burn, it'll just sit there. A star like that will just sit right there on the main sequence, chugging away, burning its fuel burning its hydrogen for as long as there's hydrogen to burn. But eventually, whether it's in millions of years or billions of years, that star will burn out. When a star runs out of hydrogen fuel in the core, then that star starts to evolve. And that's where the other three groups come from. A star spends 90% of its life burning hydrogen sitting on the main sequence. This is why, I said before, 90% of the stars in the sky are main sequence stars. Why? Because stars spend 90% of their lives burning hydrogen, sitting, you know, being nice and stable, being main sequence stars. That last 10% is when the star starts to die. And as the star dies, it, why does it die? Because it runs out of hydrogen fuel. So when that main sequence star starts running out of fuel, that's when it transforms and becomes a red giant or a super giant or a white dwarf, and then eventually it'll die. Sometimes that can take millions of years again. Sometimes it can take billions of years. Depends on the star. Depends on the mass of the star, right? Predictably, the mass of the star also determines how the star evolves as it moves toward dying. So that's where the other three groups come from. These other three groups are full of fascinating physics, which is a story for another day. How stars start, what happens as stars start to die is a fascinating story for another day. Um, but this is the other reason why we're not really going to focus on these three types. The, you know, supergiants, giants, white dwarfs are fascinating, but if we're looking for planets, if we're looking for alien planets around a star, let's study the main sequence stars. The main sequence stars are nice, well-behaved, they're not on their way to dying. They're going to be the best candidates to find a nice planet with maybe a nice atmosphere and maybe some nice liquid water and maybe life on there. Who knows? Giants, supergiants, and white dwarfs, they're on their way toward dying. Things are about to get really unpleasant around those stars. So if there is a planet, and if that planet has life, the odds of finding that are going to be much harder for us, much harder for us here on Earth to, to find those, those signs. So that's why that's where the other three groups come from. Most stars spend their lives as nice, stable, main sequence stars. When they start dying, they evolve into these other three. That's why you don't find stars in these black areas. You don't find stars here or here or over here. And it's because that's not how stars work. They're born on the main sequence. And as they die, they move here or here or there. And you, stars don't really pass through this region. They don't really pass through this region. Well, honestly, they do a little bit. Uh, there's a few stars in here. There's a few stars you find in here. But they're the exception. Um, in general, you don't find stars here or here because that's not the kind of luminosity and temperature that stars get, either as they're being born or as they're dying. So this is where we're going to look. This is the sweet spot where we're going to look to find nice, long-lived stars that might have long-lived planets, planets that, are, that, that are around so long that maybe life has enough time to evolve, evolve on them. And that would be, not would be, that will be a huge discovery.
All right. Have a good day, everybody.